Hi, everyone, and welcome to our physician webinar with Dr. Groats from the Mayo Clinic, uh, which is co-hosted by the ACPMP Research Foundation and by the Minnesota-based Appendix Cancer Allies and Patient Advisory Council members, um, Megan Blomquist and Angel Harrington. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Dr. Groat. Um, we're so excited to hear your presentation and to have you participate. Um, I just wanted to do a very brief overview and run through for how this evening's going to look. It's going to be an hour-long uh, webinar. If those who are joining us could please um, just turn off their cameras uh, so that we have the main presenters on, and Dr. Gross will then come on and share his presentation. We'll open it up for live Q&A and also go through any questions that were pre-submitted um, when registering. We're going to try and get to as many questions as time allows. Um, I know you all have questions, and so um, again, I'm Lauren Smith with the Appendix Cancer PMP Research Foundation, and we are the 501c3 charitable organization that funds research for appendix cancer and also funds educational events um, to better educate and raise awareness on appendix cancer and PMP. So with that, I will open up the floor to Megan Blomquist to do brief introductions. And I just wanna say thank you again. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I'm Megan Blomquist and along with Angel Harrington, we serve on the ACPMP Patient Advisory Council. And we're so, so thrilled to have Dr. Groats share his time with us tonight. Um, I'm lucky enough to be a patient of Dr. Groats's and I've been so happy. Um, Dr. Groats, I just, so much knowledge and skill and, and I've had the unfortunate situation to, to hear bad news, news that I didn't wanna hear. And I just so appreciated how you are able to deliver news in a straightforward way. Nobody wants things sugarcoated when they're talking about their health, but with such compassion. So I really appreciated these things about you and I think they make you a great doctor. Um, we will be starting shortly. Um, just wanted to let everybody know that you are able to submit questions through the chat feature and we'll go through those. And then at the end of Dr. Groats's time, we'll ask those questions. Please know that Dr. Groats is not able to answer individual medical questions. So your question shouldn't be something that you would ask your provider rather something that might benefit the whole group as a general question. Um, remember to keep your mics on mute if possible. And uh, one last thing I wanted to say before starting is that this is being put on through the ACPMP. Um, we have Appendix Cancer Allies, which is groups in different states that um, host meetings online and hopefully in person soon. Um, so you can always, if you're not part of that, follow the ACPMP website or their Facebook feed and you can join up in these allies calls. So that's something to look forward to if, if you're not part of that already. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Groats. Thanks, Megan. <clears throat> and thanks, Lauren. And thanks, uh, Angel and uh, ACPMP for letting me have this time with everybody. I'm going to share my screen. There we go. So hopefully everybody can see. Let me get started here. All right, so as, as Megan said, I'm, I'm Dr. Travis Groats. I'm a cancer surgeon uh, here at Mayo Clinic and have a special kind of interest in appendix cancer and zoomyxoma. And so uh, uh, again, thanks for the time to spend with you guys. Uh, I have no financial disclosures. Um, the only disclaimer I do have is I am a surgeon. And so uh, I like to take surgical pictures. And so there are some pictures, uh, intraoperative pictures that um, could be unpleasant, but hopefully not, um, but just to let people know. Um, and so the time here, I really want to answer your questions and try to give you as much knowledge as I can uh, for varying um, situations. But uh, these are kind of four things I thought I'd try to uh, start off with, which is kind of talking about, you know, what is appendix cancer, um, who gets it and why, and then talk about the different types of appendix cancer and why it matters, and then talk a little bit into the treatment of appendix cancer, and then a little bit into improving outcomes uh, for patients, particularly after surgery, since, since I'm a surgeon. Um, and so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so as, you, as all you all know, appendix cancer is very rare. I'm uh, sure that comes across. Um, and so appendectomy is one of the most common operations that general surgeons do, but only about 1% of, um, of all uh, appendectomies are, or appendicitis are due to appendix cancers. And so this is a bar chart here just uh, by decade. <clears throat> 
And you can see this is the, the percent chance that the appendicitis is due to a cancer. Um, and so it's very low when you're young, but it's not zero. So we do get appendiceal cancers in young patients. But as you can see, as you get older, uh, there's a chance increases. It never gets high. It's still very, very low uh, single digit percentage, but um, um, very uncommon uh, situation. But that's uh, typically what we see. Um, and so a lot of, another common question I get from patients is, is, how did I get this or why did I get it? Um, you know, patients eat um, are vegan or they eat um, organic food or they exercise very uh, religiously or they've been healthy all their lives. They don't drink, they don't smoke, you know, why did they get this cancer? And so unfortunately, you know, in appendix cancer, there's no avoidable or modifiable risk factors that we've identified. And so there's just, it's not anything that anyone did that caused the, ca the cancer. It's just, unfortunately, it's just bad luck. Um, it does increase with age, um, but obviously that's not changed. And then it is the similar risk in men and women. So men and women still have the same risk. Um, it's slightly higher in Caucasian populations, which we don't really know why, um, but there's really no, no real discernible risk factors um, for appendix cancer. Unfortunately, appendix cancer is increasing. Um, and here's another uh, graph. There's kind of older data, unfortunately. I don't have newer newer data to share with you. But um, when we look at instance per 100,000, what it, kind of way to look at it is in, is in this year, uh, this is how many patients uh, per a population of 100,000. So I think of Rochester, Minnesota, where I live here, uh, there's about 100,000 people. So back in the early 2000s, um, not even a one person per year would, um, would get appendix cancer in Rochester. So it's pretty uncommon. Um, and so over that decade, it increased to almost one. So now it's about 1%. And presumably over the next decade till now, it's probably even uh, higher again. Still not super common, so still very rare tumor. Um, but in a, a city the size of Rochester, Minnesota, you know, we'll see one or two patients, uh, a couple patients per year um, um, with appendix cancer. And so now I want to transition and talk a little bit about what are the different types of appendix cancer and why it matters. And so here's a pie chart just showing um, all the different types of appendix cancers. And so um, mucinous tumors, which is typically what we think of when we talk about pseudomyxoma parrots in the eye and what most people think of when they talk about appendix cancer, really only makes up about a third of, uh, of appendix cancer. So that's this blue here is the mucinous uh, tumors. Um, the, there's also non-mucinous adenocarcinomas. They're more like colon cancer. Um, and that's about a quarter of, of all appendix cancers. There's also uh, what's called neuroendocrine tumors, which are a very different type of, of tumor of the appendix. And that used to be the most common type of appendix cancer actually um, many, many decades ago. Um, but now I think the, the instance of mucinous tumors and other tumors are increasing and neuroendocrine tumors actually may, may, may be decreasing. Um, then we also have what's called goblet cell tumors, which is kind of a, a weird tumor that sits somewhere between neuroendocrine tumors and, and adenocarcinomas. And then uh, rarely we see uh, these signet ring cell tumors, which are um, a, a different kind of unique uh, tumor of the appendix. And so I think one of the single biggest limitations to progress in this disease type in general was just the poor communication. So I think we really had a lack of, of consistent terminology. And so what people would be calling it in, you know, in the East Coast and what we'd be calling it here and other would be different things. And so we really couldn't compare uh, research very well. We couldn't compare outcomes. We couldn't compare um, treatments because we all had different terminology for, for the different um, uh, tumors. And so it wasn't until just recently, I mean, as recently as 2016, we finally got everybody international uh, collaboration together and really sat down and kind of hashed out what are the definitions and how are we going to define these so we can finally start talking uh, apples to apples uh, amongst each other. Um, and so this is kind of the result of that. And this is a busy slide, and I don't mean really for anyone to even understand this, but basically just want to show that there's really two big breakdowns I think of um, in, in um, now these are all the mucinous tumors. Um, <clears throat> there's low grade tumors. So there's low grade mucinous tumors and then there's high grade mucinous tumors. And that's an important distinction uh, for, for me as a surgeon because it really matters on treatment and prognosis and uh, what we need to do. And so I'll go into that more in detail, but that's really what it kind of lumped these tumors together. So we could all be talking about the same types of, uh, of tumors. And they also went into detail about the neuroendocrine tumors that I talked about uh, before and how you grade them. And they also talked about the goblet cell tumors. So they, they um, define these better as well. And this is again, an old slide It's from 2002. Um, but I, what I really wanna show is just that all appendix tumors, um, a wide, wide um, 
biology, meaning a, a very different um, outcomes uh, depending on what type of penix tumor you have. So these surf survival curves for people that haven't seen these before, um, this is time in, in years um, on, the, on the X on the bottom, and this is percent surviving. And so we all start up here. So this is like time of diagnosis. And so as you move across over time, so as time goes on, you, you want everybody to stay up here at the top and still be living and surviving. So this is a very good curve if you stay up high. And if it goes down here, that's a very bad curve because that means people unfortunately are dying over time. And so you can see that, again, this is an old term, but this is neuroendocrine tumors. So they do really well um, in general and very, very few people die. And in contrast, signet ring cell tumors are very, very aggressive and unfortunately people don't do as well. And so it's a wide spectrum. Um, and so just talking about appendix cancer, it really matters the, the histology or the type um, because that kind of dictates somewhat of the, the prognosis. So next I'll be specific, uh, sorry, specifically talking about um, the low-grade mucinous tumors. And so these can be, uh, you know, lamins, um, hamins, another uh, word that we use for those, um, well-differentiated mucinous adenocarcinomas. There's kind of a, a couple that all form these, these low-grade tumors. And basically your appendix is just like a finger-like projection that hangs off the colon. And so the inside lining of that uh, appendix uh, normally makes mucin. That's a normal product, uh, uh, but a very small amount. Um, it just kind of lubricates the intestine, prevents things from getting stuck. Um, and so that's a normal function of it. And what happens when you develop a tumor um, of the appendix and these mucinous ones is they start to make lots of mucin. And so this is uh, maybe what a, a GI doctor might see when he does a colonoscopy. So this is the inside of your colon. Um, and they've gone through, this is the, col this is the cecum, the, the colon inside, and this is the appendix. And so, um, and you can see the mucin is actually uh, extruding kind of back out because it's under pressure and there's nowhere else for it to go. Um, so occasionally some people have had patients who have been diagnosed this way. They've had a colonoscopy, just routine screen colonoscopy, and they find mucin uh, coming out of the appendix. And, and then that's how we find it. Um, here's a surgical picture of an appendix I took out. So the, the colon would, I don't know, hopefully you can see my, my mouse here, but this is the colon, um, you know, would be right here. So here's the staple line where I took the appendix off the colon. And this is the normal size of the appendix. It's about the size of your finger. And you can see this is big and dilated and really full. And then when I cut it open, so I just slid, this is on the back table, I just slid open the appendix and all this mu mucin just gushed out. And that's what was keeping the stenting it. So it's kind of like a balloon, um, but instead of water, it's, it's this mucin, this jelly. Um, I call it kind of current jelly looking um, stuff. Um, and so that's what filled it up. So that's what these low-grade mucinous tumors are, as they're just, um, you know, tumors actually in the inside lining of this appendix. There's not a big mass, um, but it just makes all this mucin. And here's what the, the radiologist might see. Um, and so it may be hard for some people to see this, but this is your, like your hip bones here. So this is down in your lower abdomen. And here's contrast that the patient drank, um, filling up the bowels. So that's all that yellow, uh, white, bright, white stuff. And over here on the right side, this is where your appendix is. And so this is that mucin um, inside the appendix. And then there's this, this little bright white stuff is kind of calcifications, just like your bone has got calcium in it. Sometimes you can get calcium along the line of the, uh, the appendix uh, from this tumor. So here's another example down here, another one kind of laying this way, another one laying up and down. And so that's what we sometimes will see on imaging. So some people kind of get lucky and get caught early too, this way. You get a scan, go into the ER for abdominal pain and, and they do a CT scan. They might see uh, something like this and that's how they find out uh, they have appendix cancer. And so um, <clears throat> another uh, important thing to talk about is, is, is uh, how tumors spread. So tumors start, you know, the appendix tumor starts in the appendix and then it can spread. And, and how, it's, how some tumors spread is they can spread along the lymph nodes, which are along the blood vessels uh, here uh, to the organ. Um, some tumors get into the bloodstream, into the lungs, and, and travel to the liver, and some tumors spread in the peritoneum. And so for low-grade tumors, they don't spread uh, through, the, through the lymph nodes. So there's no risk of them, or very little risk of them spreading into the lymph nodes. Um, they don't typically get in the bloodstream, so there's very low risk of them actually getting into the lung or, or to the liver. Um, but what they do do is they can get into the peritoneum. And so the peritoneum is just the lining of your abdomen. And I think a good analogy I've heard uh, is, is thinking of as like a, a room that you're in. 
and the wallpaper or the paint on the room of the wall, that's the lining. And so that would be the same thing of the, the uh, uh, of your abdomen. It's kind of like the wallpaper or the paint that's on the inside of your abdomen. Um, and so these tumors, basically, they perforate through the appendix and then they, they float around inside your abdomen and they land on the surface of things. Um, and that's how they predominantly spread it is really the only way they, they spread. <clears throat> and so because of that, if they're confined to the appendix, you just simply have to remove the appendix. So here's the appendix. Again, that's that finger-like uh, projection off the colon. So this is the colon here. And then here's just a surgical picture of me taking a stapler and I'm just amputating basically the appendix right at the base. And then this is the, the, the tumor inside the appendix. And it's just confined there. And that's, that's all you need uh, for that type of tumor because again, it doesn't go to the lymph nodes. And so here's another picture. Um, here's probably one of those big calcified ones I showed you on the CT scan. You can see kind of the, the calcium already in the wall here. You can see they can get quite big. Um, so it's hard to predict when these might rupture. Uh, that's a question I sometimes get. Um, some people have really small ones. We caught it early, got lucky. Some people have huge, you know, 10, 16 centimeter uh, appendixes like this and they didn't rupture. And so we don't really have any way to predict when they would rupture, how long they've been there. Um, but, but definitely have seen small ones and definitely have seen really big ones. So we know it's a process that takes a lot of time. Um, oh, I guess what I want to say here was that if you, again, if you remove, if it's confined, if it doesn't rupture and it stays inside the appendix and it's all walled off, if you just remove the appendix, you can cure people and that this won't come back. However, in this case, this is the appendix here, but you can see it ruptured and it leaked mucin out. So now mucin has been able to get out into the, into the abdomen. And so if it just stays, if it's just like this, where it's just right next to the appendix, you know, the surgeon can suck up the mucin, remove the appendix, and there's really only a one in four chance that the tumor would come back. So most likely people can be still cured with an, uh, just simply taking out the appendix and sucking up the mucin. Um, but we do have to follow people um, because, again, about one in four people or one in three people uh, will eventually come back uh, with, with recurrence um, if we don't. And then some uh, people, uh, the, or some ca cases, the appendix will rupture, the mucin spreads, and it goes all the way everywhere. So here's kind of a, a surgical picture of an open abdomen. These are all your bowels and colon and liver. And you can see this jelly stuff all over floating around. The bowels look like they're floating around in it. And so that patients need, or people need surgery to remove all that uh, mucin. Um, and it still can be curative, which we'll talk about. Um, so that's usually our first goal is to do surgery. Um, and if you can get all the disease out, um, the outcomes can be quite good. So this is an old study from Sugar Baker. Um, patients uh, with low grade disease who underwent um, surgery in, in, in HIPEC and uh, you know, the blue and the gold, the blue is if you get everything out. The gold is if you get most everything out down to very little disease. So you see people can do quite good. And that's always our goal because we want, again, the survival curves to be high, stay up high here where everybody stays alive for many years. This is, this is 20, um, 20 months, so that's a long, a long time. Here's 10 years, 120 months. Um, so this is just shy of 20 years. So, so people can live uh, very long times after that surgery. Um, if we can't get it all out though, unfortunately the outcomes are not, not nearly as good. Um, and so we do try to uh, remove the mucin um, but, and, but preserve organs because now we know we can't achieve this good outcome. And so we're trying to, um, you know, prolong things as best we can, but we also don't want to, uh, take away organs and, and, um, you know, we don't want to impact people's quality of life poorly. Um, so I explained the, the debulking I, and I talk about patients. I usually say, you know, I say like cytoreduction reduction is the word I use. I try to get all the tumor out. That's the blue and yellow. And then when you can't do that, we, we try to debulk. And so, what that means is that I always tell or think of it as like a train on a train tracks. And so it's a slow moving train and, and it's, you know, we caught it at one point in time where it's on the train tracks and I can't take away the train. I can't stop the train, but all I can do is just reset the train back as far as I can on the train tracks to, to give you more time. Um, and so that's really what the, the goal of surgery is in that case. And sometimes you can too relieve symptoms. So sometimes the mucin's causing pain or discomfort or bloating or obstruction or something else. So the other goal is not only to, to remove as much as you can, but to, um, to relieve those, uh, those symptoms and to help people feel better. 
Um, other things that if you can, what other things we can do if the, if, um, if surgery is not an option, if it can't be all removed, uh, one of the new things that's coming out, uh, is, is mucolytics. Um, I'm sure some, some people may have heard that, uh, Dr. Morris, uh, in, in Australia is, uh, and it has a kind of a combination of the cesolamide, uh, cesolamine and, um, and bromide uh, called Bromac that um, it breaks down mucin and kind of makes it thinner uh, so you can uh, uh, drain it. I think the important thing to know is that, that again, uh, the tumor makes mucin, but mucin is not actually the tumor. And so, so this isn't actually removing any tumor, it's removing the mucin that's made by the tumor. Um, and so, but mucin can certainly make a lot of symptoms and, and, and can fill up people's abdomen. And oftentimes the tumor can be very small and it's just all mucin. So it, it definitely, um, I think will likely have a role, um, but it is, it's just essentially removing mucin through a non-invasive uh, situation. So what he's done in his initial trial that just came out uh, earlier this year is basically he uh, uh, sticks a needle on a catheter and he, he finds a pocket here of, of mucin and he puts a catheter in there. And then he injects this uh, bromide solution. I think it stays in for a day or two and then he, he sucks it back out. And you can see his pictures. I mean, this is a big collection and now it's smaller. Um, and so that's, that's an improvement, doesn't get all of it out. This one might be a little more impressive. I mean, you can see that this dark gray stuff is, is mucin and you can see there's very little bit of it now out here. And I think this is the catheter, I think that that, that bright white thing. Um, so, you know, it certainly it has a role and it can reduce the mucin and he's uh, has another study that's going on right now. Um, and once that gets uh, published, you know, we'll know more about how effective it is and, um, and, and how to better use it. It's not currently available in the US. Um, I know some places on the East Coast may have used it, uh, kind of a compassionate use situation, but it's pretty limited access in, in the US, but something that might be coming down the, the pipeline. Um, and another thing, so going from what I just talked about, minimally invasive using catheters to, to maximally invasive now, um, you know, multivisceral transplants. So usually when I tell patients why I can't remove all the tumors, because I, because if I took it all out, I would take out all your intestine or something like that. And, and, and that's not compatible with quality of life. And so uh, transplant gets, gets over that problem because now I can take everything out and I just put new healthy organs back in. So um, with that concept, uh, multivisceral just means that you're, you're transplanting multiple organs. So unlike where a diabetic who has a kidney failure just gets a kidney or where somebody um, just gets a liver who has liver failure, now you're talking about transplanting the liver, the stomach, the pancreas, the small intestine, and the colon, all the organs, because you're going to remove all of them to get the tumor out. So quite extensive, pretty radical um, uh, solution. It's just in its early stages. They've studied it in England um, in just a few patients, um, but you know it seemed reasonable, better than a lot of us uh, anticipated, actually, with the recovery and um, and the quality of life uh, afterwards uh, in the patients who who survived and did well. Um, and so there, this potentially may be an option for some people. Um, uh, in, you know, in the future, especially as, you know, organ, um, organs are a scarce resource. Unfortunately, there's always way more people that need them than we have, but as technology improves, you know, I mean, someday we may be able to print, uh, organs, uh, with stem cells, we may be able to grow organs. So I think as that technology improves, um, this actually might be able to be something where you can grow your own, your own organs and, and, um, and that might be an option. One thing I didn't say though for low-grade tumor is systemic chemotherapy. And that's because in general for the low-grade tumors, so that's the disclaimer for low-grade tumors, chemotherapy is really not of much benefit. Um, and that's because, you know, chemotherapy really works in fast growing tumors. So tumors that grow fast, uh, chemo kills cells are dividing fastly, growing fast. And so in the low-grade tumors in general, they don't grow fast. And so typically the chemo then affects other cells in your body more than, than the actual uh, chemotherapy. Um, but that being said, you know, there are certain patients, even with the low-grade tumor, that do seem to benefit. So it's not an absolute, um, but I would just say it's a general uh, thing in the data. Um, you know, here's again another survival curve. Um, and then you can see the red and blue pretty much cross over. And that's, uh, for, I think blue is the chemo group and red is the no chemo group. So there's, there's really no difference um, 
you can see in the survival when you look at a whole population of patients. But it's always individually, things can be slightly different. But, um, but in general, chemo is not very effective. This is in 2016, so it's still you know several years ago, and things are always improving. So maybe someday we'll have better chemotherapy for low-grade disease. So now I want to transition to high-grade tumors. So I'm going to make a big transition because things are going to be different for the high-grade tumors uh, than for the low-grade tumors. So we'll kind of compare and contrast a little bit, and hopefully I don't confuse too many people about the differences. And, and but so we are. So we'll make sure everybody knows that we're switching to high-grade tumors of the appendix and high-grade mucinous tumors. So as I alluded to earlier, the low-grade tumors, remember, do not spread through the lymph nodes or the bloodstream, and they only spread to the peritoneum. In contrast, the high-grade tumors, which include moderately, poorly differentiated, signet ring cell type uh, mucinous tumors, those do spread through the lymph nodes or can spread through the lymph nodes. They can spread in the bloodstream and go to the lung rarely, but, uh, and, but and more commonly, they can go to the liver. Still, the most common spread, though, is the peritoneum, just like the low-grade tumors. But now you have these other ways that it can spread. Um, and so, <clears throat> and because of that, um, often if you, if you, a patient who has this cancer will be recommended to have their, a portion of their colon removed. And so the reason why, again, is, as I mentioned, is the, is the lymph nodes. So the can cancer, again, is in the appendix out here, and it can spread to these lymph nodes. So I tried to draw these, these little lymph nodes in the blood vessels here, but it didn't do a very good job. They normally, the blood vessels are shared between the colon and the appendix. And, um, and so the lymph, the where, if the cancer from here would spread along these same lymph nodes. And the lymph nodes, just like I, I drew here, are right along the blood vessels. And so you can't really remove the blood uh, lymph nodes um, without removing the blood vessels. And you can't remove the lymph node, or sorry, the blood vessels without removing the colon. So it's kind of a package deal. That's why you have to remove that that right side of the colon here um, in order to get these lymph nodes. And so in these higher grade tumors, um, that's, a, that's a, a risk that they can go to this. And so that's typically why, um, why a surgeon would recommend that. And this is just an intraoperative picture of, of the colon and the stapling that we use to divide it. And I'm just dividing the colon right here and, and, excuse me, taking all these lymph nodes here. And so then again, in contrast uh, to the low-grade tumors, in the, the higher-grade tumors, uh, chemotherapy can improve survival. So now we see a difference between this red curve and this blue curve. So we see that uh, it's pushing it up, up and to the right, which is, again, always better to be way up here, bad to be down here. So it's pushing it. So that's, that's good. Um, so the chemotherapy, we think, is, is what's doing that. So in the higher grade tumors, um, it does seem like chemotherapy is, is, it can be beneficial. So I think these, these cancers now are growing fast enough that chemotherapy can work is the way I, I think of it. We still do surgery uh, for patients with high grade tumors. Um, and in what surgery is, again, I use that word cytoreductive surgery. Um, and, and why the surgery is so different or unique is it's really uh, a systematic. Uh, I tell patients we literally have to look in every nook and cranny and be very systematic about it so that we don't um, miss any tumor and we remove all the tumor. And so we try to remove all the tumor and we try to preserve all the organs if we can. The lower grade tumors tend to not be so sticky. And so they tend to peel off really easily. And so those tumors, you, you often can um, preserve a lot of organs. Um, the higher grade tumors tend to be more sticky. And so if the tumor's on top of bowel or something like that, it, it's really hard to peel off. And so you often do have to, to remove the organ, so, uh, or portion of the organ. So um, the higher grade tumor surgery can be more challenging and more difficult, um, but we still can do it. Here's just a surgical picture of sometimes of a, of a patient with, um, I think this was a higher grade tumor. You see all this white and, and nasty stuff is all, all tumor, just everywhere we went when we got in there. And you see, you know, after the course of an operation, it's a long surgery, you know, eight, 10 hours of surgery, we were able to kind of chisel all that tumor off and actually save uh, all the intestines and the colon and, and all the organs. So, um, so we often can do that. And what HIPEC is, is it's, it's, it stands for heated intraperitoneal uh, chemotherapy. And, and then really, this is a, a kind of a package deal again, typically. Um, we do the surgery to remove everything that we can see, the surgeon can see. And the goal of the chemo is really to, to um, get rid of any microscopic residual cells. 
So in, in other cancer surgeries, we, we talk about margins and we talk about kind of resecting other healthy tissue around it, making sure we're all around the, the organ so we have negative margins and we do a good cancer surgery. And, and then this cancer, as I told you, I, I'm just peeling it off. I can't get wide margins because I'd have to take out every organ. Um, and so this is how HIPEC kind of kind of came about was a way for us to help the surgery. So the surgery, I still think is, is 95% of the, the oper of, of the benefit. I mean, you have to get out the tumor, but HIPEC is a way to kind of boost and try to get rid of those microscopic cells and try to help improve or decrease the chance of it coming back. Um, and so we do it at the time of surgery. So after we removed everything, we, uh, this picture just shows we kind of close up the abdomen temporarily, the skin, and then we put the catheters in through the incision. So there's no more uh, scars. And then the chemo depicted in the green here gets pumped in and it goes to the catheters and distributes in the abdomen. And then it gets kind of um, pulled back into this other catheter and then back to the machine, which heats it again and then pumps it back in. And so the temperature is about 42 and a half degrees Celsius, which is about 108 degrees Fahrenheit, which is like a hot hot tub. I mean, it's a pretty uncomfortable hot tub. It's not meant to burn or scald anybody, but it's it, at that temperature, uh, cancer cells are actually more susceptible than normal cells uh, to heat. And so the, the heat itself actually can be uh, cytotoxic to cancer cells. And it helps get the chemotherapy into the cancer centers cells better and uh, cells that are hot stresses them out and makes them more susceptible to the chemotherapy. So it seems to augment the, the benefits of the, of the chemo. And so that's kind of what, what HIPEC is. And so another common question I get is what are the outcomes after, after surgery? And it really depends on, on again, the, the, the tumor biology, like what is, what is the type of appendix can, um, cancer? So here's a, a, a graph of our patients. Um, and so this is, again, this is the low grade, the well differentiated. So these are low grade tumors. And then the blue and green are kind of lumped are, are typically the higher grade tumors. And so this is from the date of surgery is zero. So date of side reduction, high pec. So we did surgery and you can see for a low, the well differentiated, the survival is very good. It stays up high, you know, and here's five years is about here. So five years, the vast majority of patients are still alive after a complete side reduction. So we got all the tumor out from the low grade tumor. Unfortunately, after over time, there's still, you know, some, some people do get recurrences or, or pass away. Um, but in general, you know, 10 years is out here. So it stays, stays fairly high um, for a long period of time. Um, and then just like you'd expect, moderately is kind of intermediate. So it's in between and then poorly is, is bad. So um, those outcomes are not, not nearly as good. So it depends when people ask, you know, what is the survival? Can people survive? So yes, people can survive a long time after surgery. Um, it's a better chance of it with the low grade tumors, um, but, um, but we have long-term survivors in, in all these groups. So another question I get is, is who is a candidate for surgery in HIPEC and how do you determine? So, um, you know, again, the goal is again, to remove all the tumor while, uh, uh, you know, resulting in acceptable quality of life. Uh, you know, we, and so that's a kind of a, a, a collaborative decision between patients and, and the surgeon. So um, sometimes to get, get all the tumor out requires, you know, stomas and, and where, where people have bags. Sometimes it requires um, very extensive surgeries and long recoveries. And so it depends on, on what, um, you know, the surgeon and the patients are willing to, to do. So it's, it's a, there's not a one answer for everybody. But usually imaging is pretty accurate. So we can, based on the way we look at scans, um, we can be pretty comfortable in determining if we can get all the tumor out. Um, laparoscopy, sometimes we use that. That's a general anesthesia procedure where we go into small incisions, stick a camera in and look around. Um, and that's usually more helpful in the higher grade tumors. Um, but that sometimes is used to see if, if we can get it all out. Um, and then, as I mentioned, it's, it's a, a mutual, a joint decision between the surgeon and the patient. And so, you know, uh, the surgeon experience is, is important. Um, and so this is a, a pretty major operation. And then I think I always encourage patients, it's a good idea to get a second opinion or a third opinion. Um, and it's okay. Um, it's a, it's a very big decision for patients. It's a big, um, surgery. And so I think getting another opinion is always um, a good idea. And it may just reaffirm that you're on the right track and, and they may, you may um, recommend the same thing, but at least then you know for sure. Um, and then of course, you know, patients have to be healthy um, to undergo such a big operation. So lots of factors that go in that too.
Um, and this is just a picture I, I put of the, of the scan. <clears throat> you can see all the tumors, this dark stuff all the way around like a, like a big protective shield, but all the intestines on the inside look pretty normal. And so we knew that that, even though it looked terrible on the outside and it was rock hard when you pushed on the belly, we felt like everything was probably pretty normal inside. That's th thankfully what we found once we kind of split down the middle. So we cut through the middle here and kind of almost cracked it. All this was that hard mucin that just on the momentum and then all the organs were actually normal and fine. So, um, so we were able to do a surgery in that case. So um, I lastly just want to touch base a little bit on the outcomes after surgery and how we can improve them. And then I want to open it up to, to questions and make sure everybody gets to um, ask as many questions as they can. Um, so recovery after surgery in HIPEC is pretty, pretty extensive. And, and so any, any of the patients who have been through it can tell you um, it, it takes a long time. As surgeons, the things we look at, we measure, and we study is, is kind of these, these, um, these kind of parameters, which sometimes are different than what, what you know, patients are interested in. But obviously, we don't want anybody to die in, in three months. So, so risk of that, so this is opposite. So risk of that would be you know, 3.5%. So very low chance anybody would die of surgery within 30, uh, 90 days of surgery. Um, we don't want to have any reoperations because um, that means that something went wrong um, and we had to go back. So that's pretty rare. So 8% risk of reoperations in general. Um, we want everybody to go home and, and do well. And so we don't want them to go to nursing homes or to rehab facilities. So in general, that's very uncommon. Um, in this study, it was about 9%. Um, again, our goal is always complete side reduction, but you know sometimes there is a role for that debulking. So, um, so this number, I think this it, it, it's deterrent. It doesn't, I mean, our goal is always to do that, but I think there is a role for debulking. Um, you know, we don't want people to keep coming back to the hospital because that means, again, something's wrong. They're not recovering right. They can't stay at home. And so, um, you know, basically about a 20% chance of people getting readmitted. So, actually, fairly high um, chance of that, unfortunately. Um, and then this is just long hospital staying and complications. So, there's about a 42% chance, you know, with the surgery in general, when we look at a whole group of us, uh, about of some complications. So that could be anything from a urinary tract infection to pneumonia to a clot to something major like, uh, you know, bowel, bowel connection not healing and leaking or um, uh, something else, a heart attack. Um, so it's a, you know, fairly high chance, but sometimes that can be my, minor complications, sometimes it can be more significant. And so one thing we've studied is trying to figure out how we can improve these outcomes. And so um, we've come up with this, there's a lot of talk about this enhanced recovery. How can we shorten uh, you know, people's recovery? So we went back and looked at, uh, at patients in recovery and tried to figure out you know, what was the things that, that were um, notable about all the patients who recovered very quickly. And what we found out is, is if, if you feed people early, you limit their IV fluids, you use, you know, spinal blocks, epidurals, non-narcotic pain medicines. Some narcotics are really um, not good. Um, you know, and you don't put drains in and you don't put NG tubes in and you don't do all those kind of things that we used to do. Um, and you don't put people in the ICU and keep them intubated. Um, then they do really well. And so we kind of put this together as a, as a package of kind of enhanced recovery of how we take care of patients after surgery. And this is, this is uh, actually published by my colleagues, uh, Mayo Clinic in uh, Scottsdale. But the blue is before they, so the old school, with the old way we used to do things, um, and then then with the new new um, package of trying to um, do all these things here, and you can see we dropped that complication rate, which in our experience was was thirty some percent, dropped it down to twenty percent. Um, so the risk of complications go down if we if we follow these, and same thing, hospital length of stay dropped from nine to seven. And the amount of pain meds people needed dropped dramatically. So, so I, I think a lot of people across the country, world now are, are, are doing enhanced recovery for, um, for side reduction in, in HIPEC. But that's one thing that we can do as surgeons to help people recover, at least in the hospital. There's still significant recovery at home. Um, and then we looked at, in this study, just looking at what are some of the predictors of how people, um, uh, that people that struggle or, or don't do well. Um, and so there are some factors, again, that, that, that are in our control. Um, so the fluid really comes out the IV fluids. And so um, we're very um, careful about not giving people too much IV fluids. There's some things that just aren't, aren't, you know, are not modifiable, you know, people's age, their nutrition status. And there's some things that really are probably more to do with the tumor. So PCI is like a measurement that we use of how much tumor there is, a burden. Operative time is probably an indirect measure of tumor burden. So it takes longer to take out more tumor. And same thing with blood loss. Um, 
you know, the, the, the more sticky it is, the more challenging the tumor is, the more, more blood loss. So probably these are all three, uh, uh, just a, a measure of just, you know, very advanced disease. Um, so unfortunately, the only thing we can actually change is the fluids. Um, and so that's what we've, what we've done uh, with surgery. The other thing, I think lastly, I think this last one that we're looking into is, is you know, surgery is typically done big open incision, and that has to do with a lot of the recovery, some of the recovery. Um, some of those pictures I showed you are just huge tumors, and there's just no way you could ever get those out without a big incision. But there are some people who, who are found, who are diagnosed uh, incidentally, meaning, you know, they didn't have symptoms, they just found on a scan or, or got lucky and kind of found it early, and have very little disease. And so in those patients, we can actually do the surgery um, through minimally invasive uh, technique. And so here's just some of the uh, publication we've done doing robotic surgery. Um, and so this is in the OR, this is someone's abdomen, and these are the, the trocars that we put in uh, small incisions. And that's how we get the robot little arms, the robot arms go through these and then does the, the surgery on the inside. And so we do a big surgery on the inside, but we can have small, small incisions. So this is something we've done again in people that have very low, um, a low volume. They don't have those big, massive tumors I showed you in a lot of those scans. So, but this is an option for some people, uh, again, to try to rec improve that recovery, uh, decrease their pain, decrease hospital stay, um, and things like that. So uh, hopefully it looks like we'll have lots of time for questions. Um, so hopefully uh, everybody um, gained something from that. In summary, I just want to say that, you know, again, there's lots of different types of appendix cancer. And I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes about is, is making sure we're all talking about the same thing. Um, the instance, you know, again, is increasing, uh, but not dramatically. And again, unfortunately, there's no modifiable risk factors. There's no hereditary syndromes. You're not going to pass this on to your family. Um, and as I talk about treatment and recovery can be quite extensive. Um, and that's why, you know, groups like ACPMP and uh, Megan and people like that are, are so important for both the research that we can do to hopefully improve things, but also the patient support, education, um, and just, you know, awareness, again, for, for such a rare tumor. Um, so I really thank, again, the ACPMP, Megan, Angel, um, Lauren, for, for having me today and for all you guys do. I'll turn it back over to, to questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Groats. Um, we really appreciate having you here and Minnesota is very lucky to have you um, in our state at the Mayo Clinic. Um, there are quite a few questions in the chat. So while I go through them, um, I would love to know more about you. Um, did you grow up in Minnesota? Why did you choose Mayo Clinic to practice? And what got you interested in treating appendix cancer since it is so rare? I know I always love to hear about specialists coming on board to help us out. Sure. So I'm, I'm from Montana originally, uh, grew up on a ranch, kind of cattle, cowboy uh, kind of uh, life. Um, I guess I, I did, we did a lot of our own vet stuff. So I just liked that kind of medicine is how I kind of literally got into medicine. Uh, eventually came here for college, went to St. John's University, played football there, and then um, went to medical school in Nebraska and then came back to residency here. It was really in Nebraska where I remember I took care of my first patient. I think there's always a profound patient experience that like changes your whole trajectory, but it was, um, it was in Nebraska at a patient who, um, you know, had, had some external parrots in the eye and it just, it just, I just saw how, how little there was known about it, how, how no one knew what to do. And, 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 and you know, and, and, and then I, then I saw the, the surgeon at that time in Nebraska, you know, who we did the surgery and, and then, you know, took this all this tumors everywhere. Everyone thought that, you know, the, the patient was going to die and that there's nothing we could do. And then he did this operation and then, you know, got all the tumor out and the patient, you know, fortunately did really well. And so it just had such a profound impact on me. I've had a, you know, a disease that I felt like there's a lot of confusion, a lot of things that we could improve. There was a lot of room for improvement. And then just, and as a surgeon, seeing something where you can take something that's, you know, so extensive and, and you, you can, you know, um, get rid of all of that and, and, and potentially, um, you know, cure people, um, that was really impactful. So that was my first experience. And then I just, um, continued to, to, to enjoy doing that. And, and, uh, since then, so. Great. Yeah. Well, we're very fortunate <laughs> that you're here with us and so thankful that that sparked your interest in appendix cancer. Okay. So we have a question and then, um, Holding back time, I'm not going to say the name of who's asking the question, just ask a boy. Um, 
so wait and it, my screen just moved on me. So wanted to look, talk about the mixed type. Does that refer to a combination of low and high grade? Um, some people sometimes seem to start at low grade and then becomes high grade. How or why does this happen? Sure. So yes, there, there are some uh, tumors that, that'll change. The, initially, they were low grade. I've never seen them go high grade to low grade, unfortunately. It always seems to go uh, the wrong direction. I th it, you know, and I, we looked at this back uh, several years ago, and I think we, we said it was about 10, 12% chance over time that that could happen. Um, so, so it's not in, infrequent. Um, and it usually is, yeah, from low grade, it eventually becomes high grade. I think, um, you know, as tumors change, they can mutate more and they can gain more mutations that cause them to be more aggressive. So um, I think that's probably the biological reason, um, you know, why that, why that can happen. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, next question, and I might paraphrase this one a little bit, um, but it goes around um, surveillance of the disease and how difficult it can be, like some tumor markers can be unreliable. Um, the best detection, people talk about MRI, CT scans. What are the best current tools out there right now um, for monitoring the disease? Sure. So, I mean, you know, tumor markers, you're right, are, are not uh, effective for everybody. I think it's really helpful individually. So if, if one patient had a lot of tumor and their tumor marker is really high, and then you do surgery or treatment, and then it goes away, then that, then that tumor marker is very reflective of that individual's uh, uh, tumor. Um, so that's why I think it's always good to check it at baseline. Um, that way, if someone doesn't have elevated tumor markers, you don't have to worry and, and, and charge them and their insurance company with more tumor markers because it's not going to help. So I think, you know, so individually, uh, tumor markers can be helpful. Um, scans, you know, we've, in the research, we've done tons of this on CT scans versus MRIs and, and people have shown either one can be better. I think honestly, it just depends on whatever your institution's really good at. Um, so, you know, like I know the group down in San Diego, they just have really gone with MRI. And so they've gotten really good at it. And just like anything, if you do it all the time, you get really good at it and they probably are, are, you know, the best at MRI. And then here personally, I think CT scans are a lot easier to read. So uh, we've worked really hard with our radiologists and come up with a really good protocol. So I think it, again, it's just more wherever the institution you're getting treated at, whatever they're, they're the most comfortable with and, and, and use the most, I think it's probably the most effective. Um, one thing that is coming up um, that's really attractive is, is looking at what we call tumor cell-free DNA. So in some tumors like um, colon cancer, stomach cancer, and other cancers, we can actually detect um, uh, DNA from tumors in people's bloodstream. Um, and so that's <clears throat> the hot topic now in cancer uh, 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 physicians is, is measuring that and then understanding what it means. And so I haven't seen any data yet for appendix cancer, but I, I'm sure it's, um, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be coming next. Great. Okay. Um, so you talked a little bit about in your presentation about um, poor, moderate, and well differentiation. Um, how do you find out what your pathology is? Is that how does one find that out? Sure. So part of that 2015 or 16 um, uh, consensus group of pathologists was to make like a consistent um, uh, way that we document uh, the pathology. So ever since then, um, you know, pathologists should then report that, that differentiation, that, um, that grade, if you will. Um, and so in your path report, it should, that should be a part of it. Um, um, next question, during HIPEC, um, is the type of chemo ever varied? And is there one type that seems to work better over others? Good question. Um, you know, the standard had been a, a, an old drug called mitomycin C for a very long time. Um, there was just recently, earlier this year, uh, a big study that came out, um, multi-institutional all, all across the world, actually, um, uh, collaborated together and actually found that maybe a combination of two drugs might be better. Um, and so just in the last few months, we've kind of gone to that, that combination of drugs. So, um, so yeah, I think it, it changes. There's different regimens out there. Um, I, we don't have great answers for which one's the absolute best, um, but and that's something where we definitely need to keep working on is, is trying to find you know, the optimal uh, drug, both from a toxicity standpoint, but also from an effective standpoint. 
Great, thank you. Okay, this is a question that comes up repeatedly in the Facebook support group pages. Sure. And that's about how many times you can have HIPEC done. <laughs> um, is there a point in time where it does can cause more harm than good? Yeah, and, and absolutely. So I think there's not a finite number. It really depends on the extent of each 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 HIPEC. I mean, again, the rate limiting step is is the health of the of the patient, and then also the extent of disease. And so, you know, each time you're probably removing some organs. And so, you know, um, there's only so many organs that we can remove safely and have good quality of life. So, if you're fortunate enough the first couple of times not to have a lot removed, then then that may allow more recurrent surgery in the, in the future, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, if your first operation is very extensive, then you, you probably don't have a lot of room, um, you know, for more surgery. The other thing I'd say too, is it's like anything, if it, if you keep doing it and it doesn't work, um, at some point, you know, you have to say, we keep operating and it keeps coming back. So, um, you know, it doesn't seem to be, to be beneficial in that situation. Okay. Um, Another question that's come through, and I'll paraphrase a little bit, um, at a point in time, if HIPEC is not an option for a patient in treatment, are there other options out there? We talked a little bit about the, the um, BROMAC and then a little bit about um, the, the multivisceral transplant um, and a little bit about chemotherapy. Um, that's really all that's, that's really out there for now. Um, the, the group at Wake Forest are looking into immunotherapy. Um, they've so far, it's only been studied really in, in cell models and culture models and not really in patients. Um, so we have a long ways to go, um, with that. Um, but those are, those are kind of the, the main options, unfortunately. So, um, um, and I know we only have about 10 minutes left or so. I don't know if Lauren, you wanted to uh, bring up some of the pre- um, submitted questions for Dr. Groats. And you're on mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Um, yes. All right. So a couple of questions that were pre-submitted. Um, one of them being if a patient has a tough recovery in the way of GI perforations, is there any correlation to overall long-term healing? Yeah, um, you're right. So we've shown, or we've done studies and, and shown that, unfortunately, when people have severe complications like that, it, it does seem to um, increase their chance of the cancer coming back. I think that's the question they're answering. And I don't know exactly why, maybe inflammation, you know, we know inflammation can cause cancer. I don't think it's causing a new cancer, but I think the inflammation, the, um, the, the growth factors that are probably your body's making to try to deal with the inflammation, I think are kind of like fueled to the fire and, and kind of help the tumor, um, if there was any residual, um, grow back. So it, you're not doomed for recurrence, but I think if, if, um, it does increase the risk, unfortunately. Okay. Thanks. Um, Okay, another one was saying, if the tumor was found early uh, during the appendix removal, is chemo always recommended or watch and wait? What would your typical approach be? So if it's found early, which we're seeing more and more of this, thankfully, because I, I think amongst physicians and, and, and even patients, we're starting to get a little bit more awareness and probably you know due to things like, like a CPMP. Um, but uh, so, yeah, if it's removed it through the appendix, then, like I said, if there's no perforation, no rupture, and if it's low grade, so this is where it gets kind of confusing because it all depends on all these variables. But if it's low grade, I mean, people are cured. There's, it's not going to, because it can't go through the blood vessel, it can't go through the lymph nodes. If it's high grade, though, um, then, you know, then there, you do need to take out the lymph nodes. And if the lymph nodes are involved, then we typically do recommend chemo. So, it's hard to give me give you a one answer because it depends on a lot of different things, and that's why uh, you know you just got to see see your your uh, an experienced team to help kind of guide you through that. But um, but it, it can be a role um, after uh, some some tumors are resected. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I dropped my phone dropped the audio. Um, all right. Thank you for answering that. And kind of just piggybacking on that. Someone asked how many 
cases annually do you see where that is the case that patients kind of caught their disease early? Is it really even more rare or what would you say? I think it's definitely increasing. I mean, I remember when I was training, I, it was really rare. I don't remember ever even seeing hardly anybody early. Um, I think, you know, for good or bad reasons, people get a lot of CT scans now uh, for all kinds of reasons. They go to the ER for something and they get a CT scan. So I think we, we catch things uh, a little bit earlier that way. Um, and it's, you know, and it's hard for me to know what I see compared to like what's normal because I just get referred to all these, but I, I have a, a, quite a few patients that I follow who just had the appendix removed either by myself or by another surgeon and we just follow them. So it's, um, I think it's increasing uh, for sure. Hard to give you a solid number of how many people. Yeah, um, I would definitely say it's increasing. I mean, we've seen studies, um, Dr. Halavati with Vanderbilt, she recently just came on and did a webinar with ACPMP about uh, the increase in um, appendiceal cancer patients uh, for young patients. Mm. Um, so I think it, it does seem like there's an increase, um, a heavier prevalence. Um, so just continuing moving forward, um, one question is specific to you, Dr. Groats, is that are you accepting new patients? Um, if so, what is your contact information and what is the usual wait time for new patients? Sure. Yeah, we're always, uh, you know, uh, happy to help and see people. Um, you know, fortunately, most people have the low grade tumors. And so those are, are in, you know, slower growing. And so time is, is fortunately on your side. Um, and so I think in, in this area, most, most of us that do this type of surgery do book out usually kind of four to six window kind of week uh, window. And so it's pretty common for you to, to see some uh, surgeon, but not have a surgery for about four to six weeks. Um, and that's a very safe uh, time with, with, um, with a low grade tumor. Um, and we work it around sometimes around people's major life events and things like that. Cause we do have a little bit of, of time. I wouldn't wait six months or a year, but we definitely have, uh, you know, uh, weeks to a few months to, to wiggle around, especially in the low grade tumors and then the high grade tumors, sometimes with chemotherapy and stuff, we can kind of, you know, figure out, um, when to schedule, um, surgery. Um, and yeah. Perfect. Can I pipe um, in for a quick second? Yeah. As a patient at Mayo Clinic of Dr. Groats, I found <laughs> that on the patient end, it was super, super easy to get in. I just called the Mayo Clinic number and they are so centralized in terms of like taking the call and funneling you to the right place. I didn't have to Google much. I, you know, I just called the Mayo Clinic number and they set me up with Dr. Groats. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Megan. Yeah. And you don't, um, you don't need a referral. I think that's something that people always assume. Um, that you need a referral, not from us, sometimes insurance companies, maybe if you're like on an HMO or where they make you, but it, but, but Mayo doesn't require you to have a referral. You can just, like you said, call up or, or email or whatever and, and uh, request an appointment. Awesome. Thanks. Um, one final question that we have time for is um, what are the chances of recurrence after 10 years out from surgery? Um, how would you say for long-term survivors that are joining us, um, what would you have to add? Yeah. Um, so one of the bad things about slow growing tumors is that, that, yeah, you know, you, you have to follow people longer because it, it can come back over a longer period of time. So most tumors, they're more aggressive, you know, after five years, we typically start using the C word cure because, um, it's very uncommon for cancers to come back after five years. Um, but in appendix cancer, you know, we definitely have, I've seen people, um, uh, sometimes, uh, just the other day I had somebody who was like 18 years or something like that. Um, you know, and, and it came back. Um, and so, I don't know if, I don't think we know of how long you, you have to follow people. I think it, there's a small chance. It definitely decreases your, your risk decreases over time. So I, I would tell survivors, I mean, I wouldn't live in fear that it can always come back, but, um, cause that risk does decrease over time. And so the fact that you're alive and well doing good 10, 10, 12 years out, whatever, um, is good, but, but yeah, I also don't want to give false reassurance. I mean, it is possible. What we typically do here is we try to follow people, keep following people, but we do spread them out more and more. I mean, I definitely have people I only see every couple of years um, mm -hmm. just to keep an eye and and because they're so far out. Um, and again, it's a slow growing tumor that even in that two year time span, um, you'll still catch it usually before people have symptoms. 
and and usually but when you can still intervene so um so yeah i think um, long-term surveillance is important awesome um well i think that's it for our time i'll just quickly say uh how grateful we are to have had you on uh, this evening and to share um you know do your presentation and also spend some time answering some questions that I know are so important to our patient community. Um, so I just wanna say thank you again to Dr. Groats um, on behalf of all of us with the Appendix Cancer PMP Research Foundation. And I'll quickly let um, Megan and Angel hop on as well too. I, again, I wanna say thank you. And probably on behalf of both Megan and I, uh, Dr. Groats, that was a fabulous presentation, very simple. I actually wish I, I was texting Megan. I said, I wish I had that information 10 years ago when I was diagnosed <laughs> because it would have saved me a lot of time, a lot of fear and a lot of frustration in trying to pinpoint what information I could about appendix cancer. Um, also, thank you to Lauren and the group at um, the Research Foundation for organizing this and getting us going. Um, and again, to everyone who, who showed up today, thank you for participating. Um, for those of you who may want to share this with someone, I know this will be posted as a webinar to the Research Foundation website which is acpmp.org. Um, also for information on other events that may be going on, um, like the Research Foundation on Facebook. Um, and anyone in Minnesota, if you're getting treatment in Minnesota or live in Minnesota, um, we have our own smaller um, Facebook group specific to Minnesota. Um, so look for us there too, and that's Appendix Cancer PMP Support Group of Minnesota. So. Um, lots of ways to stay connected and stay in touch. Again, Dr. Groats, thank you so, so much. I'm mm -hmm. glad I finally got to put a face with the name after all these years of <laughs> hearing wonderful things about you. Um, and Megan, do you have anything uh, to add to that? Just agree with everything that you both have said. Dr. Groats, <laughs> you're the greatest. Thank you for no. giving us your time. Thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank and you I all. Thank you, Dr. Groats, and thank you, everyone, for organizing this. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Bye.